So hello and welcome everybody to the final session of day two of the Rethinking Economics Festival 2020. It is very exciting to be launching in this online format, which hopefully will be used in the future of Rethinking Conferences from now on. Throughout this festival, we are asking how we can harness the power of pluralism and diversity, both within and beyond economics, to approach today's biggest issues. How, through new ideas, tools and perspectives, we can envisage and emerge into a brighter world. And the topic of today's session is one that I never experienced in an economics textbook in Ireland, which is Buen Vivir as an alternative to development. Buen Vivir translates in some ways as good living or as in an indigenous Quechua language of Ecuador can be accurately translated as living in plenitude or living in abundance. So today we have two fantastic speakers joining us. We have Lera Iriarte and Miriam Lang. And the layout of today's session will be that each of our speakers will talk in turn about 15 minutes each. And then we will host a short conversation between the speakers before opening up to questions from you in the audience. We are very keen on having lots of audience participation for this session. So you can use the chat, or if you have a question in mind, please use the Q&A tab, which is down below. And even if you don't have a question, if you look at the Q&A tab, you can see other people's questions and you can upvote the ones you like to sound up. And a little bit later, we will be returning to those questions. Please refrain from any abuse or anger in the chat as it's quite unpleasant and we will ask you to leave. But luckily in the festival, this hasn't been an issue so far. And you can also use the festival hashtag, which is Rethink Econ Festival 2020 or hashtag Buen Vivir, which we will post in the chat as well. I am the host for today. I'm Johnny McCreech. I'm based in London at the moment. I've just finished a degree in sustainable development in Uppsala in Sweden, where I was involved in the group Rethinking Economics Uppsala. And that is where I know Lena from, who is also helping us today. And we have Ross from Rethinking Economics, who is joining us in the tech department also. So I will take a short introduction from an article from another uh, leading Buen Vivir scholar, Eduardo Goodian, goodness, goodness, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, and it's his introduction of what Buen Vivir is. So Buen Vivir are the Spanish words used in Latin America to describe alternatives to development focused on the good life in a broad sense. The term is actively used by social movements and it has become a popular term in some government programs and has even reached its way into two constitutions one in Ecuador and in Bolivia. It is a plural concept with two main entry points. On one hand, it includes critical reactions to classical Western development theory. On the other, it refers to alternatives to development emerging from indigenous traditions. In this sense, the concept explores possibilities beyond the modern Eurocentric tradition of development. The richness of the term is difficult to translate into English. It includes the classical ideas of quality of life, but with the specific idea that well-being is only possible from within a community. Furthermore, in most approaches, the community concept is understood in an expanded sense to include nature. Buen Vivir therefore embraces the broad notion of well-being and cohabitation with others and nature. In this regard, the concept is plural as there are many different interpretations depending on cultural, historical, and ecological settings. So with that, I will now pass over to Lera Eriarte. Lera founded and runs El Buen Vivir, a social consultancy promoting work on happiness and quality of life within communities based in Pamplona in Spain. Lera combines her scientific education with a broad complementary background in humanistic and practice-based areas. 
And we can see this with her work, which is focusing on bringing research into practice. El Buen Vivir is currently focusing on the Gran Lugar para Vivir, the great place to live, which is a certification scheme. So please, Lara, I take your time. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I will share my screen with all of you. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Lady Diarte. I'm uh, the founder and director of El Buen Vivir. As Johnny said, this is a social consultancy and we are working from Spain, but our uh, advocacy is international. It's a pleasure, a big pleasure to stay with you. So thank you very much for the invitation. I will try to summarize some of the ideas that we've, we have been working from El Buen Vivir since a couple of years. And I will link these ideas with the international happiness movement to, with you. In, um, in summary, uh, I have 10 ideas. So let's start with that. First, the concept of the El Buen Vivir, the good living, and as Johnny explained, it's um, a combination of three levels. It considers the persons, the society, and the environment. So it's important to, to, to consider the, the three dimensions. We can define it as the welfare of society through the achievement of life in harmony with oneself, the person, the identity of the person, with society, which could be equity, and with nature, which could be translated as sustainability. Good living is a model of development that seeks the common good, the common good for all people based on solidarity, cooperation, and equity through collective work and mutual care and nature. And um, in the good life, uh, it is proposed that public policies uh, should be oriented towards the implementation of forms of life in harmony with all beings in nature, with all human beings and with oneself. And we will go to the details a little bit later. My second idea is that during the 20th century, we have, as humanity, we have achieved many, many issues but we have many challenges ahead. First, I would like to say that during the 20th, 20th century, we have tripled the population over the planet, which is a quite important uh, figure. And also we have doubled the life expectancy. But this, this development is not um, uh, neutral, as you may know, our ecological footprint has is much higher than one than one planet that we have. In uh, 1970, uh, we overpassed the our uh, the Earth capacity, and today we the global ecological footprint is about 1.7 planets. So we need more planets than what we have, which is <laughs> an issue. And also, I guess that you have heard about planetary boundaries, which is a, another relevant concept that we should consider. Um, this means the limits, um, these limits are a conceptual framework that evaluates the state of nine. You can see here that there, there are nine uh, fundamental processes for the stability of the Earth system and suggest a series of thresholds for these processes. And if we exceed that, that um, limit, uh, we, are, we are in risk. There are two cycles here. We have the li life uh, safe operating space when we are in the inner cycle. And we have, if we pass this cycle, we could be in a zone of high risk. And as you can see here, there are two um, boundaries that we have passed, and those are the um, biodiversity. This is one that we are in risk, and the another one is the biogeochemical flows, considering phosphorus and nitrogen. And also, we are in we are getting um, in a more problematic state for land system change and climate change. 
there are um, there are many effects on nature that once you get a tipping point cannot be reversed. Uh, the, re the results of these effects are not are not linear, and we don't fully understand many of these processes yet. For example, the deforestation in the Amazonia ecosystem might lead to a collapse at one point because the processes of the ecosystem at are not longer occurring and this might occur when some tropical forest is still there so deforestation is not the uh, effect of deforestation may not be linear um, also uh, we should consider the um, the trends of some indicators environmental indicators for example the co2 emissions at global level are still increasing and as today still there are more investments in fossil energies than in global climate which is important to consider uh, on the other hand we have issues related to mental health since uh, 2012 and the united nations the world happiness report is published maybe you have heard about that and in this report a ranking of the happiness by countries is presented presented and relevant issues for happiness are addressed and discussed. Today, in uh, 2020, the average happiness in, the, in Earth was 5.3 in a 10-point scale, which is, sorry, which is quite a low figure. And also today, uh, mental health is coming an issue. Uh, and what, unwanted loneliness uh, is um, more and more an issue, especially in some West countries. In 2015, 3.6% of the global population suffered anxiety and 4.4% depression, which means more than 300 million people, which is quite a lot. Depression is the most relevant cause of disability and it's an important sickness causing morbidity. And suicide is 800,000 people every year in the world. And important to say that in the Sustainable Development Goals, I, I will say some words about that later, there is an indicator about suicide, which is a good news for development. I would like to, to share a, a question with you. There are as, uh, many efforts to improve our ecological footprint and to alleviate poverty all around the world. But my question is if we are addressing the real causes that have created the challenges. We can come back to that later. My third point is that we have a definition for personal well-being. This is not an abstract and exoteric concept. It is a science and we can work and improve it. Aristotle said that the happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the, the whole aim and the end of human existence. So this is uh, something that uh, have been important for humanity since a long time ago. Happiness usually is understood as a state of mind, the quality or, or a state of being happy. And well-being is considered as a value defined as a good or a satisfactory condition of existence, a state characterized by health, happiness, and prosperity. We are going to use both terms for the same ideas, happiness and well-being, even if there could be some differences in some context. Uh, I would like to share as well that uh, during the last decades, uh, scientific people from different disciplines have progressed a lot to understand what makes us happy. We have a lot of evidences to know what can help us with happiness, with our own happiness, with the happiness at the society level, and what is not useful for that. But sometimes we forget about that and we, we don't take that into account. And also to say that from the perspective of the positive psychology, uh, there is a model which is called the happiness pie, which said that about 40% of, of our well-being or happiness depend on our intention, on the activities that we do. 
and it's about 50%, which uh, depends on the genetics, and 10% on circumstances. So here the, the point is that we have some room to improve our own happiness. This is not something that God gave us and it's not, um, we cannot change that. In fact, being happy is not neutral. Here you have a summary of different things that change, some aspects that change uh, depending on your happiness levels. First, important to say that we have more satisfactory life experiences we have more healthy lifestyles. This uh, translates into better life and longer life expectancy, which is quite important in life. Happier people have better social relationships. It doesn't mean that if you have a good social relationships, you are happy, but the, the contrary, you are happy, then it means that uh, most happy people have good rela social relationships. Happier people are also more caritative and cooperative. They can develop more sustainable behaviors, which is quite important for addressing the sustainability challenges that we have, are more energetic and they have a better performance. They are more creative and innovative. This is associated with positive emotions. They are more resilient. They can um, address uh, difficulties and also, they are more participatory in political elections, which is quite important aspect. Happiness is a relevant issue at the society level. Uh, our level of personal happiness doesn't depend only on our person, but also in the context that in, in which we live. There is a, in an experiment and they, they saw that Immigrants in a given country have so the same level of happiness as native people of the country. So the context is very important for happiness. And in the World Happiness Report that I mentioned earlier, there is a ranking of, uh, of the countries by the, their happiness level. And as you can see, we have the Nordic countries in the top, which is not surprising, but also I would like to show which are in the bottom. And we have Afghanistan with a war, and we have many countries in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Important to say India, which is the largest democracy in the world, has a very low level of happiness, which is um, an issue. In, the, in this report, in the World Happiness Report, they say that there are some predictors of life satisfaction at the country level. So these figures, the, the number, can be explained by, by different issues. And uh, the result is that 75% of the result can be explained by six factors, which are, which are the physical and mental health, the GDP per capita, social support, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and social trust. So as you can see, we, we have um, different issues related to the society level. Happiness can be measured and it opens the doors for a beyond GDP paradigm, which is something that I guess it's a very, it's an issue for the economists. Um, today, um, the indicator for progress in, at the country level has been the GDP but the, the, the GDP only measures the activity of, uh, of the economy within a boundary, a country or a region, but it doesn't say anything about the, how healthy and well the society is doing. It's only a number. We have the SDGs as a broader measure of um, mis, uh, a broader measure of uh, sustainable development. The sustainable development goals uh, are the roadmap for sustainable development to 2030. They consider aspects related to planet, to people, to prosperity, to peace and partnerships. I guess that you have heard about them. They are 17 SDGs. And uh, I've been part of a research uh, trying to see if the SDGs are measuring or not the happiness issues. And what we saw is that there are 
relevant aspects for happiness that are not considered within the SDGs and sure that the SDGs could do could generate some positive impacts in some part of the world if we are doing if we are progressing properly but we want know if this is contributing to happier society or not and uh, contrary to what happens with the SDGs that we have this global measure we don't have a global or universal way of measuring happiness there are different indices at different levels and since uh, we lack this uh, global index I have cre I've been part of the group creating this aggregated happiness index which comes from a, a benchmark of different indices that are use nowadays and as you can see uh, what uh, the index consider is a broad uh, dimensions of life it takes into account community and social support culture economic standard of living education environment governance health housing conditions safety subjective well-being time balance and work and within this index it's important to consider objective measures, what we can see from the statistics, but also perceptions. Perceptions of people are really key to, to understand what, what is happening. Um, until only some years ago, well-being has not been considered as, I will, sorry, I will put this here, has not been considered directly as a policy goal, but Nowadays, um, governments, there, there are more governments considering uh, the long-term benefits of well-being and then consider this into policy making. I will show some examples later. Well-being is not only the absence of ill-being, it's something else, is to consider the, um, the capacity to, to enjoy life, to have a satisfactory life and understanding the purpose of life. And uh, traditional clinical psychology and psychiatry focus on removing unhappiness. The well-being interventions focus on moving people up in flourishing about the neutral point. So focusing really in well-being. Investing in happiness can be a cost-effective action and offers a win-win approach. Um, not always the higher the investment, the better the results. I think the economics know that. Uh, I would like to provide an example in that in the health sector. For example, in the US, in the United States, the average investment in health is 9,500 36 US dollars per capita per year and the life expectancy in this country is 79 years while for example in Spain our investment is 2,354 US dollars and our life expectancy is 83 years. Sure there are many factors but um, I wanted to show this, this difference. Um, also, another example is in the UK from the Better Access to Psychological Therapies, which is a program that uh, it happened in this country. They, they have shown that for one dollar spent in depression and anxiety, one dollar is saved in medical care and additionally 2.5 dollars are gained in productivity improvement. So we have different investments in uh, well-being that can be very cost effective. There are many efforts all around the world at different levels of governance. Uh, just to say that there are uh, examples at the United Nations levels. For example, we have the um, annual publication of the World Happiness Report. And also since 2018, we have uh, the Global Happiness and Wellbeing Policy Report. And we have, the, we have a compilation of many different uh, happiness policies happening all around the world. We have also the Better Life Index from the OECD, given a lot of information for OECD countries. 
We have also uh, at the national level many examples. Maybe you have heard about Bhutan with uh, a country that developed the gross happiness index several decades ago. They measure happiness, but the point is not only that they measure happiness, but they develop policies to improve happiness of people in the different dimensions of life, which is the key. It's not only to have the, the number of the, to have the diagnosis, but to do something with that. And as you can see, there are uh, many other examples. We have El Buen Vivir in Ecuador. I think Miriam will say something about that later. And um, some countries doing a lot of efforts are the United Arab Emirates that they have developed a Ministry of Happiness and they are they have different policies in that respect and also in the UK the National Wellbeing Program has done a lot of, of things. We need a revolution without losers to try to to progress in this happiness movement and in El Buen Vivir vision of life. This is not a sentence or a quote that I said. This is this was said by John Helliwell, who is, is a, a Canadian economist and is known as one of the fathers of the happiness movement. Um, I'm sure that the, the challenges that we have ahead are not technological, are not about money, but are about our inner resistance to, to change. And I'm sure that working on happiness may change our world visions. It could help us to change our priorities, our behaviors, and could help to, to this revolution. And I would like to, to finish my presentation with a quote from Nelson Mandela, which is that everything seems impossible until it happens. And I'm sure we are in the right moment, in the right place, in the right conditions to really try to, to um, give the, the possibility to see the world we, we want to live in. So thank you, and I'll be very happy to, to answer your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, potentially you could stop sharing screen now, and then we will move over to Miriam. Uh, so Miriam Lang, if you're ready to share your screen. Miriam works as an associate professor for environmental and sustainability studies at the Universidad Andina Simon Bolivar in Ecuador. Her research focuses on development critique, systematic alternatives, and the territorial implementation of Buen Vivir. She holds a PhD in sociology and a master's degree in Latin American studies from the Free University in Berlin. She combines decolonial and feminist perspectives with political economy and political ecology. She is part of the Latin American Permanent Working Group on Alternatives to Development and coordinates the Global Working Group Beyond Development. Miriam collaborates with the Feminisms and Degrowth Alliance, FADA, and social organizations in Latin America and in Europe. So please, Miriam if you would like to take the floor. Thank you so much, Johnny. And I'm really excited to be here in this space and to share it with so many people from around the world. So really, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm not an economist. <laughs> and just to make that clear, I'm a German originally based in Ecuador and working in and with Latin America since like 40 years now. Um, and I would like to share with you some insights from research I have conducted in the last years about how Buen Vivir is working in practice, because there's a lot of talk about it. But I think in here in Ecuador, we have communities who are practicing Buen Vivir and from whom I think we can learn a lot. So this is about a mode of living, about a way of being in the world and understanding the world differently than the mainstream dominant modern capitalist civilization uh, would direct us. 
a civilization that is also colonial still until current days and patriarchal, by the way. And um, sorry, um, when Vivir is being practiced around the Latin American continent, Latin American continent uh, by very different peoples and communities, mostly indigenous communities or black or also peasant communities and also urban marginal uh, communities. So it's not just for rural people, this is very important to say. And it's a sort of understanding which is, has not been theorized so much by the people who practice it, but it's based on some few general principles which are uh, shared by those very different societies that, from my point of view, live at the margins of growth-based modern capitalism. And it's very important to stress here that the societies who practice Buen Vivir are usually categorized as poor, as underdeveloped, as backward by those languages of representation that neoclassical economics have imposed on us with the dominance of growth as the main indicator, GDP growth. Uh, so they are represented as unsuccessful and somehow in need of help. Um, which uh, comes from the standardized poverty indicators that we commonly use. So there's where my talk and my research connects to layers actually, uh, because if we measure poverty as monetary income or as the ability to consume, I think that it's tell, it is much more telling about the usefulness of a person or um, family to capitalism actually as about how this family or person is perceiving his or her own life. Um, and it produces the invisibility and insignificance of those modes of living in the world. Um, but we have to say that these communities or uh, societies that I'm talking about are contributing rather a lot to uh, our modern world because, for example, indigenous people alone today manage or have tenure rights to more than one quarter of the world's land surface. And this quarter intersects with about 40% of all terrestrial protected areas and ecologically more or less intact landscapes. That means those people have preserved the biodiversity that still exists. Um, and at the same time, there is research proving that small peasants are providing our world with 70% of the food that we are actually eating and that industrial agriculture is more about speculation and finance than about food that we is actually consumed so this is very important to stress too and um, subjective assessments of well-being or qual quality of life can lead to very different results than the data provided by standard poverty indicators like income or consumption poverty. I will talk about this a bit more later. So my research has been conducted in two regions, counties of Ecuador, which you can see on these maps, in the Ecuadorian Andes. Um, and I understand territory as, because I'm talking about Buen Vivir as territory practice, as the, the place where this mode of living does take place, but also as the political result of a special combination of power relations in this space, which is the territoriality produced by the people collectively. So uh, I, I also found it very important to share some pictures. We will start first in the southern location, Nabon, um, which is here at the right, uh, rather rural village with some organic agricultural production. And here we can see that contrast between official poverty surveys and subjective well-being well surveys. Nabon has been categorized as one of the poorest places in Ecuador twice uh, in two censuses, one conducted in 2001 and one in 2010, which is the last one that has been done by the national government. And three years later, you can see it's very high 
poverty indicators, like almost 90% have been categorized as poor. And in the subjective well-being survey that had been con conducted by a university in 2013, more than three quarters of those same people express that they are highly satisfied with their lives. And they had been asked if they are satisfied with their occupation, with their family life, also with their financial situation, with their leisure time, with their, their relations to the environment. And uh, an important thing is if they have the ability to control their own life, if they have sovereignty, auto-determination in their own life. So we can see here that the languages of valuation that we use to express well-being or quality of life can lead to rather very difficult, diff different and contrasting results. And this should trigger some reactions. So a very important principle of Buen Vivir is that it can only be thought of as existence in community. Uh, Johnny cited Eduardo Godinas at the beginning, who said something similar. It refers actually to a collective subject, not so much to individuals, which have been the form of subjectivation imposed by capitalism. This is competing individuals. Buen Vivir is about collaborating individuals individuals in the community. Um, and certain dimensions of life are understood as commons that have to be collectively produced and they have to be protected and uh, they are not only about material things like taking care of a forest for example but also relational like relations of collective caring for the elders, for the youth, etc, for the sick for example. And uh, so the individual would, in such a community, it would give, part, give up part of his or her autonomy by submitting to some binding agreements, to some collectively agreed upon rules uh, that guide this community. And those agreements are not fixed like in Western law, but they are under permanent scrut scrutiny of the community and can be changed in an assembly if needed. So deliberation is a very important aspect for Buen Vivir. Um, and you know, those I, I would like to point out because I already know that there will be some questions about idealizing communities, etc. Uh, it is not a very ideal form of community that I am trying to describe. It's a very pragmatic form of community because it only can exist because it effectively provides some benefits for the people who share it and solves concrete needs associated to the reproduction of life. If this wouldn't be the case, the community just would fall apart. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there can be conflicts, there can be tensions. I will come to that later. And one other uh, important pillar is that work is not understood so much as only paid formal work, but there are many forms of communitarian work where these commons are produced and maintained and protected. So I can show you some examples of that in the rural and in the urban spaces. Um, and another very important thing is uh, relationality and interdependence. So when Vivir doesn't frame quality of life so much as uh, material abundance, but as quality of relations. It is a mode of understanding uh, life er through relations. It understands life as the result of material and spiritual flows that must harmonize in some way. So this web of relations is not only between people, but also with nature with the surroundings, because there's not even a conception of nature as something distinct of humans. Humans are part of these surroundings and must coexist with them in a reciprocal and balanced manner to ensure the reproduction of life. And this also includes some other time dimensions like the ancestors and sacred places in this spirituality 
uh, sacred places are normally places which are especially important for the reproduction of life, like the mountain where the water comes from. It's not sacred because of some religious uh, thought, but because of, again, the very pragmatic function that it has for the community. Um, So what, another very important thing is that the prosperity or this abundance or um, yeah, for the community, which is the goal, is seen for the whole of the community, while accumulation of wealth or of power for some people within the community is seen as a threat because it could create imbalances. So normally, when we were oriented communities have installed mechanisms of redistribution when there is a starting imbalance to um, yeah to just deconstruct that i will give an example in a minute and another important thing is that those communities often apply different sorts of conflict resolution and justice like indigenous justice systems or communitarian justice systems which are focused on restoring this equilibrium basically and not so much on sanctioning infractors or criminals so it is a whole different way of understanding justice as reparation and restoration and not so much um, punishing so one classical mechanism of redistribution is the fiesta, <coughs> the partying, <laughs> which, uh, for example, in the community, if someone gets too rich, he will certainly be chosen as the next prioste, as the next um, sponsor, we could say, for the fiesta. So we, he would have or she would have to pay the food for the whole community during three days or something, yeah? So that this wealth can be shared between all and just goes away because it was too much, yeah? Um, at the same time, democracy, a certain form of radical democracy is an important feature because when we it has to be constructed from the bottom up. The assembly is the relevant organ here where decisions are made and there are not representatives. Uh, authorities only have the task to implement the decisions taken in assemblies and they are rotating so that they cannot accumulate political power. So each year someone new has to take this task and the task is not seen so much as an honor but as a duty to the collectivity. Um, so here we can see some examples of assemblies and um, the kind of relations that are thought uh, rotate very much around complementarity and reciprocity and proportionality. Reciprocity is a principle of interrelating um, which is not so much it's like i give something to you and you have to give something back to me but it's not how it works like it's more a general principle of giving yeah so i can give something to you and we will not have a, an accountability but you can give something to someone else and this someone else will give it back to me some sometime for example and complementarity is a principle of integrating contradictions. So in the Andean philosophy, for example, you have lots of dual principles like the male and the female, the sun and the moon, the hot and the cold, but they are never seen as opposites, like the male is not defined as opposite to the female, but as complementary to the female. They are both needed to make a whole. Uh, an integral world, yeah? So uh, normally the authorities in the traditional when we were practice always have to be composed by a woman and a man, for example, to make this equilibrium. Um, 
also, uh, which is something important to stress, is that those communities do not seek homogeneity. When you seek complementarity and reciprocity, which is about exchanging uh, skills or uh, exchanging goods, you need diversity necessarily, because if everyone would have the same, you couldn't exchange anything, right? So diversity is welcome. It can be political diversity, religious diversity, also uh, in abilities, and normally uh, also people from other places can move to these communities. And also sexual diversity in some cases, not in all, I must say, is welcome. Uh, this is important to stress. All communities are obviously not pure. They have convived with colonial power relations and lots of acts of violence and imposing religions. So there is also discrimination in some of these communities in different ways. Here we have an example of barter markets, which would uh, yeah, show an example of reciprocity. And Wendy Weir is not an anti-capitalist ideology like socialism, for example, or anarchism. It is just a mode of doing things that is dysfunctional to capitalism. It doesn't reflect so much on itself as being anti-capitalist. But, um, and we already said that it is plural, like in every context, as it is built up from the bottom, it must uh, relate to this context and it can't be the same between one place on or the other. Um, something very important from the recent experience in Latin America is that yes, it has been consecrated, introduced in the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia, but it's translating into public policies has mostly failed. We can discuss this later if someone wants to know more about it, but very briefly, um, the intrinsic dynamics of the modern state, which is very uh, an, an institutional framework very useful to capitalist economics, uh, has expropriated Buen Vivir of its dysfunctionalities and just streamlined it into uh, being another world for development, for example, yeah. So um, while these practices exist in our countries, at the state level, Buen Vivir doesn't exist anymore as a practice now. And uh, I would say the state institutions would have had to change much more than they did in order to make this work. So there are some development plans translated to Buen Vivir. There was even, as you can see on the top right, a credit card called Buen Vivir. <laughs> so whatever was possible around Buen Vivir, this was in Venezuela, by the way. Um, but I would like to point out quickly what is dysfunctional to capitalist accumulation about Buen Vivir. For example, it, the fact that it emphasizes collaboration and not competitivity, of course but it also does not embrace private property. It is built on collective territories normally, which should not be able to be sold or seized, but rather uh, work through usufruct arrangements um, and also collective uh, sharing of water, of seeds. Uh, it's not so much about appropriation, yeah? And it, does allow for individual self-determination to a fair extent. So it's not uh, just doing individualism away, but it doesn't embrace individualism as a goal, but it does insist on this common uh, sharing and producing, yeah? And finally, of course, when we does not confer in central importance to money or money mediated relations, although money is there, it circulates and it has its own place in life. Um, and it does not separate production from reproduction. It's just one holistic uh, understanding of work and producing life as a whole, maybe. So this is also a pillar of capitalism that it does not embrace. 
And this dysfunctionality, of course, generates a lot of conflict. So these communities or these societies are being constantly attacked through different mechanisms. One mechanism I will just stress too is the destruction of their material basis, like the expropriation of the land, direct violence, the destruction through uh, pollution of the rivers, for example, people live off or of the forests. Um, so this is under threat. And the second thing that is under, under threat is the recognition of these modes of living because they are systematically being made invisible, as I already said, by being presented as lagging and marginal and ignorant and, of course, irrelevant and somehow to be overcome by modern development. Those are the people that development economists have to develop and show them what a really good life is, which is participating in capitalist markets above all, yeah, <laughs> or participating more in them. And yeah, where when the very strong, it normally has flourished beyond the state or generally in absence of the state. And in these societies, welfare is being largely provided by kinship networks or through the community. Um, and the expectation, there is still a relation with the state, of course, because they are in, is located in some state's territory. And the expectation toward the states is rather that they leave them be, that they do not interfere so much and do not tell them what they should do and how they should live and just recognize those territories and give the people who produce those territories sovereignty about them. And of course, there are lots of tensions about this too, it's especially around extractivist projects when some leaders are being bought by big transnational firms in order to sign a contract which can destroy the whole community from within through these conflicts. However, what I could see in my research is that there are also, it's not just that are we, we are losing when we were territories all the time through all these attacks and it would just be a rest of them that I am now featuring, but there are also dynamics that regenerate when we were and that make it expand again at the same time. For example, when we had these changes in the constitutions, when collective land rights are strengthened, when um, a, a resistance process is successful and communities and organizations are strengthened through these successes. And the two examples I conducted my research at Nabon and Cayambe uh, just show that at the local level, at the municipal level, it is also possible that states institutions actually are captured by the logics of Buen Vivir and can, may, can be made productive to strengthen when we yeah. For example, when they find ways to certificate collective land titles, or when they consolidate assembly democracy at their local country, county level, or when they conduct those needs assessments which are contextualized and democratically built like the one in Nabon I talked about earlier, or when the collective work logics are strengthened and extended to urban spaces and simply collective community and self-rule is recognized by the municipality. So there are lots of examples where this happens and where Gwendivir is actually getting stronger. That's it from me. Thanks. <laughs> And thank you so much, Muriel. That was an incredibly interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, perhaps you can stop sharing screen as well. Yeah. So I think uh, now we can just quickly go into the Q&A session, which Lena is going to help coordinate for me. I saw we have lots of very interesting questions already. So what I will say is please write your questions in the Q&A tab. Upvote others that you are interested in. And yeah, Lena, would you like to select the first question for us? Hi everyone. So thank you for posting so many questions. I think that's great. I cannot guarantee so far that we'll have time to cover them all. And so 
I might try to avoid questions that are overlapping each other. All right, uh, my first question, I think, will go to um, Leire. Um, also, so I will name the, the person who wrote the question. And if you are happy to, I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself so we can get a bit more of interaction. If you are not happy to speak in public, which is perfectly fine, just don't say anything and I will read out the question for you. All right. So the first question to Leire will be asked by Chloe Marie Kikilis. Also, apologies if I butcher your name. So, um, Chloe, I will now enable you to talk. All right, I think I'll take this one. <laughs> so she, um, Chloe Mary is saying, um, as a South African, one of the most pervasive myths that I recognize as detrimental to justice is the notion that the poor are happier and more grateful for what they have. This is used to alleviate the reach of the guilt of inequality. How do we ensure that we use the concept of happiness to implement material changes in the redistribution of goods and opportunities? Is self-actualization perhaps a more useful rhetoric, or can we radicalize happiness? Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'm not sure if I could address all the points, but um, it's not the poor that are happier than richer people if we are talking in um, terms of uh, money. I would not say that. We have seen the ranking from the World Happiness Report. We have seen at the bottom the, um, some of the least developed countries in economic terms. So um, it's not that. Uh, I would say that uh, we can use happiness as an aspirational view and um, to try to develop inner values, not only extrinsic values, but the happiness movement can help us to uh, develop uh, a society with other values than the one that we have right now. And this could be very useful for, for uh, I would say, for, for many things, that, uh, for many challenges, to address many challenges. All right, thank you so much for answering that. That was indeed a quite complex question too, <laughs> to start with. Sorry, that gives you a proper warm up. Um, so the next question will be directed to Miriam. Um, there we go. And the question is asked by, again, I'm sorry, Atanas, Atanas Kotov. So you are now permitted to talk. Hi, thank you. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a bit anxiety provoking. But <laughs> um, so yeah, my question is, how can good living philosophy be implemented practically in systems? And does that mean, a sh can you hear me? Can you say that again, please? I okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, how can good living uh, philosophy be implemented practically in systems? Does that mean a shift to another economic system rather than capitalism? Or would that be through reform? Also, do you think we need a universal solution or should solutions be applied locally? I think you gave a bit of an overview of that, uh, but I posted the question beforehand. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would like to ask permission to also say something to the question that was asked before to Lady, if I may. And Absolutely, go for it. Yes. The second one, yeah. I think it's very important to think about material redistribution and justice. So I totally agree with you because we have levels of inequality that are absolutely unbearable in our world today, but we should have a really profound discussion about what material, what do we mean by material redistribution? Do we really want to redistribute only money and everyone should get the same share and or income? Yeah. So because this would mean to expand the capitalist mode of living, which is so harmful for us all even further. So I think that can't be the way and that cannot be the way how we understand justice and redistribution. Rather, I would suggest that we have to think about modes of restitution, of reparation, of redistributing the material basis that is necessary for each mode of living. For example, land tenure, the access to water, 
like fertile soil, seeds, etc., for people who live in the countryside, and all the, the means that are necessary to produce life collectively or to reproduce life collectively. And these can be very different in different contexts. So, and give back to, because we have now had centuries of dispossession, and this has brought us to this point of inequality where we are now. So, of course, the rich have to be less rich. Those are the problem. We should focus on those, yeah. And we have to give, give people back their self-determination of how they want to live collectively, not individually, that's important. And think about other ways of understanding the materiality that we need to reproduce life, not in terms of money. Um, and uh, so this brings me to the second question. I think what I tried to point out is that um, in the Buen Vivir perspective, economics is not a really existing category. It's not about an economic system that has to change to another economic system. It's about a mode of living that has placed economics at the center and has subordinated life and people to like serving this God of economics and growth, yeah, and GDP um, to a system where work and sharing have their place in a, in a web of relations that is a lot broader and that includes ecology, for example. It's like we don't, we wouldn't separate, this is the economic and the social and the political and the ecological, like modern epistemology has taught us to do, but we would put those all together again and see that they coexist at the same level in a certain equilibrium and not one is like sticking out as it does today. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask a further question or is, uh, should we proceed somehow? Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, I was just wondering how would uh, that happen be because with socialism and anarchism, again, we have this idealistic society in which we're all kind of equal and working towards a common goal but uh those systems um i'm not very familiar uh, with anarchism to be exact but uh with socialism there's a lot of um well imposing um and there's propaganda as well uh there's um not much individual freedom as was said uh we're working towards a, a collective goal but that mainly happens through a lot of um, a lot of forceful forceful uh, activities mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the main point is that when we were in plural like los buenos vivires <laughs> has to be built up in a certain territory in a certain context by the people who live there so there is no way that it could be implemented implemented by a state which tries to equal it all down to indicators that are the same for all the people. This is why I'm very skeptical uh, of measuring Buen Vivir at a more than local level. I think people have to set their own goals and they have to see how they reach those goals. But when we try to compare one region to another, we get into problems because we, we start universalizing the understandings of well-being and this is what has caused so much harm. So this is where um, we should uh, maybe question our ways of, of doing things. And so I think that when we very low, can only be implemented locally, but that does not mean that there can be no connection or coordination further between those localities. This is absolutely needed. And we also need to think about new forms of institutionality that can um, like, uh, create balance, for example, between very poor regions in resources and very rich regions, like some regions who are desertic and need water and others have plenty of water. How do we share those uh, means for life, for example? Yeah, but this is not the 
it's neither the socialist state as we have known it in the 20th century, not at all, and it is not the liberal state either. It is thinking and building up new ways of institutionality which are able to respond to those concrete needs. Thank you, that answers my question. And it's a really innovative way to think of the state and locally as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Miriam, for this. Um, and uh, next on, I would like to take Katrina Hay Hayworth's question. Um, Katrina, I will now enable you to talk. And again, you don't have to. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I just want to pick up on the, uh, when we were talking about kind of the ecological footprint being over the Earth's capacity and the reaching the planetary boundaries, um, and whether you think there's a trade-off between ecological preservation and improving happiness. Um, so uh, the majority of people, it's well documented, will have to um, really reduce um, their emissions and especially like everyday usage like cars, planes, like uh, meat especially. Um, if there's a big push for this kind of reduction, um, what implications does that have for the well-being of societies? Um, yeah. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. The uh, thank you very much for the question. This is a key question. I would say that um, a key point is to, to, to change, to evolve from a materialistic value society to a more uh, a society based on inner values, on our personal values. And in this, uh, well, consumption lose a lot of relevance in that. You know, you are not what you consume. You are not what you have. You, you are something much, uh, much more than that. And also it's important that for happiness, we don't need to, to consume, we don't need to, to have many things. We are happier if we have our experiences, we share our time and our life with people. This is very important for happiness as well. Um, so I would say that these, these are important things. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Leila. Miriam, would you like to add something to that? Very shortly. I think the health of our environment is very related to our own health. And um, this is a very, very important factor of well-being. So, yes. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Yeah, may I, I would like to add something in, in this uh, direction. Thank you, Miriam. I would like, maybe you have heard that um, the pandemic we have suffered, the COVID-19, it's a zoonosis, and you know, it, it comes from animals, and uh, the, the big reason for that is because of the ecological degradation, so everything is interconnected, and this is something that we need to, to learn and to to, to bring with us the importance of this interconnection of people, societies, and nature. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Johnny, would you like to jump in with the next question? Yeah, so I would like us to go to Anna Rojo, who had a question. And if I could just tag on a question of my own, I believe Anna has a question for Miriam, but perhaps afterwards as well, Lera, you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about the Grand Lugar Para Vivir certification scheme. But after Anna asks her question, so we'll unmute you, Anna, if you wish. Hi, Miriam and Leary. Thank you for your presentations. Um, so I had one question for Miriam. So I recently conducted um, research on an indigenous community in Mexico that is governed under a model of Buen Vivir. And something that struck me during the interviews was that for respondents, the socio-political model is often reduced to an element of folklore in academia, something researchers enjoy to look at and be surprised by, but that is not truly recognized for its value as a humanist and philosophical proposal. Um, so my question is, what actions could we take um, 
as researchers to avoid making when we did practices merely an interesting anomaly, anomaly for us to look at. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for that question. I think this is effectively a challenge because these practices are so important and so guiding as systemic alternatives in the current multidimensional crisis that we somehow have to find ways that people way beyond these communities where we are discussing them, take them seriously and learn from them. And well, the ways I find is, for example, we just created a new master's study at my university, which is called Political, uh, Political Ecology and Alternatives to Development, where one uh, column with it, it is built on is dialogue of knowledges, like bringing non-academic knowledges into the university and taking out the students to the communities and to effectively interact and not just observe like anthropologists the folkloric ways of doing but to listen to the people and try to understand what is going on and how they relate to each other and why they do that and if they are happy for example or not doing it yeah so that's one way and i think there has yeah we need to open up much more spaces where this dialogue of knowledges can happen on an equal basis, which is very, very difficult because of the arrogance of modern Western science and of modern Western institutions, which always will see, for example, indigenous people as marginal or so they will be condescendent. And we have to, to try to create these conditions without racism and without this uh, anthropological glance as a dialogue really. Thank you. Um, maybe I can continue? Yeah, thank you because this is perfect that you, Johnny, formulated the, the question. I would like to contribute as well to, to implement the worldview of El Buen Vivir. And this is why we are working with the standard, the quality of life standard for Western societies. Here, we are starting here in Spain to work with municipalities and territories to try to, to, to uh, improve the awareness about the quality of life that we need to look beyond money and economic growth and things like that. And we need to take care of sustainability and well-being, personal well-being and communities well-being. And this is why we have developed this standard, which is the translation would be a great place to live in order to help communities to, to do this transition, to, to develop a, a vision uh, beyond money for the communities. And yeah, we, we have started with that and we hope to do a positive contribution for a happier and healthier world. world. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, next, I think I will ask, uh, Bumika Mushala, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Um, your question is quite long, therefore I would ask you <laughs> to give it as short as possible. Thank you. Um, hello? Hello? Hi, yes, we can hear oh, you, I'm go not, ahead. I'm not sure if, oh, okay. It works. Okay, fantastic. Oh, I was just quickly wanting to ask about uh, the framework of the sustainable consumption and production, which comes from Agenda 21, the 1992 Earth Summit, and um, just the uh, thinking or prospects of this as a coherent, uh, you know, toolkit or analytical frame for um, the implementation of, 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 of sustainability through addressing colonial capitalist logics, which have resulted in the overwhelming inequality of consumption and carbon footprint. You know, as we all know, two thirds of carbon space is uh, the global north since um, uh, the start of industrialization. Um, but 
there's such a deep politics to talking about uh, powering down on consumption. Um, I've talked to many policymakers in developed countries who say, you know, that is the ethical thing to do, but it's not looking likely politically. There's not really much political will to take on powering down on the consumption and carbon footprint in the North. Meanwhile, the global South says, why should we embark on degrowth or powering down on carbon footprint? Oh, we have been denied our right to development, um, you know, lowering carbon footprint in the absence of access to renewable energy technologies and the IPR issues means that we spiral deeper into poverty in the South. Um, so this is an ongoing discussion, especially in much of my work in advocacy with Southern civil society organizations, uh, especially you know, in terms of the geopol geopolitics um, in of of um, governments um, so i'd love to get some views on this uh, deeply intractable debate ongoing very much since the early 90s and even before since the limits to growth you know club of rome which was met with great consternation by developing countries who said uh, this is ecological imperialism this is green colonialism and this is means to further impinge on our right to development and our self-determination through um uh, green conditionalities um so just uh wanted to explore this thank you wow can i start <laughs> For, sorry bumika where are you talking from where are you located? Hi, I am actually, I'm originally from India and I am based in Brooklyn, New York, uh, a oh, hot okay. of activity these days. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I do a lot of advocacy and uh, civil society organizing the last 20 years. Uh, but for the last 10 years, very much in the UN General Assembly. So I've been working with the group of 77 developing country negotiators for many years. Uh, and that's where my question comes from, you know, direct right. engagement with governments. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, um, that's a really thrilling, important question. I think from my point of view, any framework will only provide a coherent strategy if it gets rid of the growth paradigm or the growth imperative. This is my main problem with the SDGs, for example. You cannot uh, pretend in today's world where we are facing uh, ecological devastation on all ends and the climate crisis is very visible. Um, you cannot pretend to make economies grow because decoupling is just a myth and this has been proven repeatedly. So there is no way to make economies grow GDP wise without causing more harm to the environment and using up more resources in terms of mater um, material flows and energy flows, which will always do harm to the global south because of the geopolitical and geoeconomical constellations that have built up through the last centuries. So uh, right now we are already engaged in some sort of disaster driven transformation with the COVID pandemic and also climate change. So I think governments uh, maybe are not the best representatives of what people need, even in the global south. There is a problem of representation and we have this crisis of political representation which expresses, for example, in the rise of authoritarian leaders in many parts of the world, which also is an expression of the uh, distress of what voters who don't find any option in which they really feel represented and say, okay, let's give this guy all the responsibility and see what he does. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, I, from the global south, I would say that um, maybe people do not embrace degrowth as a paradigm because it is a very provocative term, but saying that overall growth uh, like unspecific, unspecific economic growth would help these countries here like Ecuador. 
it's just not true because growth is achieved mainly through destruction of the country. The only growth we have here is through oil exploitation and engaging into industrial mining, which takes livelihoods away from concrete Ecuadorian families <laughs> and puts them into poverty into the cities. So we, we should really assess better what kinds, what parts of social activity have to evolve and expand and which other activities have actually to degrow and deconstruct those very broad terms into concrete harmful activities and sustainable activities and then maybe we get closer to an answer. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would like to add a couple of ideas on that. Uh, I think it the, the framework itself is not that important. I would say that the key is the will that we have behind the, the, the framework that we can develop. And um, it's clear that we need a transformation to reduce our consumption and our ecological footprint. And still, as Miriam said, our economy is linked to our uh, to resource consumption. So if we are increasing the economy, we are increasing the, the, the resources that we are consuming. So this is clear and we cannot avoid that discussion. So to this transformation to happen, I think it's key to address our idea of success. What is success of a person, of a community, of a society and fear. We are not changing in many cases because we have fear with policymakers, uh, civil society, NGOs. It's very difficult to to the 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 to to give a space uh, to the changes to happen. And for this, I think the El Buen Vivir vision, the new world vision, could be very helpful. And we need to to work in that in a new vision. Yeah, this is my contribution. Thank you. I think uh, next we will go to Ashish Kotari, if you're still here. I see you've written a few comments, so if you could try to keep them short. But I see that you wrote about the Pluriverse book, which I quite like, so. Are you Thanks there? a lot. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you to both the uh, presenters for uh, fascinating uh, presentations. I, I had a couple of comments uh, for the happiness, uh, you know, the approach. Um, and this partly relates to also what Miriam said, which is that, uh, you know, I think the attempt to try and quantify and then compare across countries and nation states how happy a nation state is, is a very, seems to me to be as reductionist as using GDP or any other uh, single uh, set of indicators. Um, and also it ignores the fact that within countries, there's enormous difference. If you take India and give one ranking to India, it simply completely ignores the fact that there are, you know, people who are extremely happy and others who may not be, uh, or, or communities who are and who may not be. But the, question I want to ask is, does any kind of global happiness ranking quantify or take into account the offshoring of unhappiness? The reason, part of the reason why Scandinavian countries have high levels of welfare, for instance, and are therefore supposedly very happy, um, is because they can exploit the global south, both uh, either in colonial times and, or now or both. And so how does that get factored into any global comparisons of happiness? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. This is a key question. I would say that if we have data are not to say that India is better than Spain or you know, the other way around, this is not relevant. I would say, what can I learn from India? What are they doing better than what I do? And how can I take the, the knowledge and the experience into my own benefit? I, I would use the data for that. Of course, you can use the data for whatever you want, but I think th this is um, a meaningful way of using them. 
And regarding the Northern, Nordic countries, it's true, they, they have a very high ecological footprint. I think this is discussed in one of the World Happiness Report, I, I don't, maybe last year or a couple of years ago, but I don't have any, I don't have in my mind any data, any resource I could share with you to, um, to take that into account. I don't know it. Maybe it exists, but I don't know it. But it's important when uh, the well, yeah, enough. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just just to add? Sorry, can I add a quick comment? Hello. Yes. Yes. Go for it. yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. No. So I, I agree with what you're saying, but um, you know the the problem is the way people generally tend to look at things. They look at that one figure. Okay, uh, Norway is highest, India is 124th. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that India should be higher than Norway or lower or whatever. That's not the point. The point is nobody reads that kind of fine print in a global happiness. So everybody, the entire world media is going to say, oh, Norway is number one and India is whatever or X, X, Y, Z is wherever. And this is to my mind an extremely dangerous thing because what it does, apart from the fact that it hides enormous amounts of diversity and qualitative aspects, it also creates this aspiration, say in Indians, to say, oh, we want to be like Norway. Now, mm -hmm. how do we be like Norway? Well, we'll have to go and colonize somebody else. So to my mind, it's actually a fundamentally dangerous approach to think of quantifying happiness and then comparing them across countries. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a very relevant comment and thank you for that. Uh, but I think this happens with all kind of rankings that you can elaborate. You can uh, compare GDP, um, human development index, whatever you have, you can have the same approach or you can use it in the way I'm, I'm suggesting to learn from others. Can I add something to that? Yes. I think um, this is a particular way of looking at the world that has come by after World War II with the era of development and growth and GDP. And I personally think that we, so the central, the, the central way that we have learned to look at the world is in uh, single figures that are comparable for all contexts. And I think this also is one of the reasons why we are where we are today and we have to unlearn this epistemic glance which is so simplifying and uh, yeah which doesn't allow for other civilizations to even exist although they are there yeah <laughs> so personally i would also try to refrain from comparing countries because a country is always a very diverse set of class, race, gender arrangements, rural, urban, generational, whatever. So a, a country figure never expresses anything that is of importance really. And yeah, that happens on the ground. Okay, thank you, Maria. And thank you, Lara. And thank you, Lena, for hosting that Q&A session. We are at the end of our time, unfortunately. Felt like we could go on even longer. Uh, what I will say is, if you didn't get the chance to have your question answered, I do apologize. Or um, if you come up with some other question later on, we have got the contact information for both of our speakers on the Rethinking Economics Festival website. And I know they will be very happy to answer you there. You can also go to Twitter or to Facebook to join the conversations there, either using our hashtags, uh, which are on screen there, or you can join the Facebook group, which we have. So thank you again, uh, particularly to Lara uh, Iriate and Miriam Lang, who have been very generous in offering their time to us all. You can see their latest works on this slide as well, with links to some other works, contact info, much of which is in Spanish and English and in some other languages. So keep up the good work and thank you. The video from this session is currently on Facebook if you want to go back and watch it. In a few days time or a week's time, we will be putting the video onto the Rethinking Economics Festival website. So you will have another chance to look at it. 
we have just put the link to the Facebook group in the chat box and also a link to a survey that we at the festival are carrying out to try to better understand the economics curriculums that exist around the world. So it takes four minutes. So if you have time, please fill that out. I hope everyone enjoyed this session. We have another few days of talks coming up. We have events on activism, decolonizing economics and on post growth. Tomorrow we have a talk on zero waste and on Saturday we have one on ecosystem services. So hopefully there is plenty to keep people interested. So for now, I'll just say again, thank you to Miriam and Lara and thank you everyone for such a lively discussion and your great questions. I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.